Welcome to Breakthrough Success. I'm your host, Mark Aberti, the content marketing expert, bringing you five new episodes every week where I and top level guests teach you how to take your business to the next level and achieve your breakthrough. Hello, Breakthrough Success sisters. I just wanted you all to know before the episode actually starts, I've been working a little bit behind the scenes to give you something really special. So a while ago, I wrote my book, Content Marketing Secrets, which helps people create, promote, and optimize their content for growth and revenue. And I just put the finishing touches together to offer that for free to anyone who is interested. So if you want your free copy of Content Marketing Secrets, all you have to do is head over to markgaberti.com slash book. Now, let's jump right into the episode. As entrepreneurs, we are constantly on the move, whether it be speaking gigs, the occasional vacation, or just commutes from place to place, we are constantly on the move. And while we are on the move, we can be working during that those moments when we are on the move. We're going to be talking about that in this episode. And this episode will be led by today's guest, who is the CEO of Alliance Virtual Offices and chairman of the Alliance Business Centers Network. He is a recognized expert on flexible working, the virtual office movement, and third place working. Prior to creating the Alliance brand, he successfully operated his own portfolio of business centers in multiple locations across North America. Today's guest for episode 256 of the Breakthrough Success Podcast is none other than Frank Cottle. Frank, it is such a pleasure to have you on the show. Well, thank you, Mark. I'm really happy to be here and I hope I can contribute something for you. Frank, I'm really happy to have you on the show. Working on the move, that's just something that like as entrepreneurs, like speaking gigs, uh, networking events, we are constantly on the move. Um, I know like as of recording, like I'm about to be on the move very frequently, like uh, like July like 16th at the time of this recording. So like podcast movement, a few vacation trips. So I'll be on the move and I know a lot of entrepreneurs can relate. So uh, before we get started on working on the move, I'm wondering, Frank, if you could give us some background. So uh, can you talk about why you started Alliance Virtual Offices and some of the initial stages? Well, um, uh, I started my career uh, as a commercial diver and immediately moved into the yachting industry. That was back in the late 60s. Uh, and uh, for about 10 years, all I did was raise yachts around the world. So that got me thinking and meeting a lot of people. And uh, we had a very successful brokerage that we built, which I sold uh, my interest in and then started this company in 1979 or 80. Um, so we're really one of the progenitors of what people today would call the serviced office, virtual office, or co-working industries. Uh, and we started uh, building buildings uh, and plugging centers into them for uh, ourselves. We started as a property company. We migrated for that portfolio, as you said, uh, to operate centers across North America. We we're the largest private business center operator in the world at that time. Sold that portfolio. And then we decided that we really wanted to work on the with the customer directly. We didn't want to own the centers anymore, but we wanted to relate to the customer. So we started our network. Today we operate 700 facilities in 54 countries. And um, we're really uh, uh, as much a technology company as a business center services and operating company. Um, sort of we are the, uh, you, know, you could think the Expedia of real estate where we bring all services together under a single platform and Alliance Virtual Offices and help individuals, such as you were saying, uh, digital nomads, you were saying entrepreneurs on the, on the go, well, I'll call them digital nomads, uh, to work anywhere, any place, anytime, long-term, short-term, and to have all the business services they need, no matter where they are, um, and to really just to support that entire community. Uh, today, there's 1.6 billion mobile workers that work outside of their primary office more than two days a week. These aren't necessarily gig economy people. These are people tied to large companies and government globally. That's 1.6 billion. So the challenges of seeing workers on the go, and we really think of workers as travelers, not as, as workers, and certainly not as employees, but as travelers. 
And we watched them move from Starbucks to a conference room, from a conference room to a co-working center, from a co-working center, maybe to a business center or back to their home constantly. It's, it's a constant motion now. And people are much happier and much more productive that way. And with this uh, increased movement, uh, like digital nomads, as you mentioned, entrepreneurs on the go, something that I uh, mentioned, uh, but either way, there's this sense of an increased amount of movement. And with this movement, uh, there people are exposing themselves to different environments that they have to work in and continue to be productive. And so as we continue to move to different places and go to different networking events and speaking gigs and things like that, how can we um, adapt to our different environments so that we can still be productive? Well, I'd say the first thing uh, is to remember uh, that um, even though we're on the move, we all we all have a home. OK, uh, we all live somewhere. We all have a home office. Your website has a home page. Uh, everybody has a home. And in order to do that, you need to have. Uh, and for, and for, in order for people to have comfort and confidence in you, you need to have an address. You need to be anchored somewhere. No matter how much you move, you have to be anchored somewhere. Um, <clears throat> which seems like in the you know, we should just be able to have a digital address. But uh, really, uh, you, you still have to receive packages and mail and, and, and meet people uh, uh, sometimes. And, and so you, you have to have an anchor. So an address is very important. After that, it's really a matter of figuring out your own lifestyle and your own movement style. And what we see is that people generally like to work in uh, four different environments. Uh, first, that home environment. It's where they're comfortable. Maybe, maybe they're there one day a week or two days a month or whatever. It's their home environment. Uh, uh, second, uh, the third place. Uh, people are comfortable in hotels and Starbucks and places like that uh, for certain types of work. It's really interim, short-term work. Uh, I have an hour here or an hour there between things, and that's when we use that third workplace type structure. The other two structures really come down to um, <clears throat> types of locations that people, the type of work you're doing. Are you working by yourself where you just need put the headphones on, high-speed bandwidth, a quality environment where they've got great coffee and everybody smiles? And you need to be there for two days or three days or maybe for a special project that you can't get done elsewhere. And then lastly, the fourth is I need to meet with a team or I need to meet with a customer. So you need to be able to meet in meeting rooms and conference rooms. And in each of those environments, you've got to have this all important life's breath that we demand today. And that's bandwidth. Uh, you've also got to have a yourself know enough about security going in and out of different environments to make sure that uh, uh, your equipment you're using, because it is a bring your own equipment uh, type environment, uh, is going to be secure. Beyond that, I just choose whoever's got the best coffee and enjoy it. And um, it's interesting how you mentioned these like different places where we can work that uh, like you go to a bunch of different locations and you will find those same consistent uh, places. And some people, when they're on the move, when they're uh, digital nomads, it means them taking vacation. And uh, sure. some people like on vacation, it's like you got two kinds of people, uh, like usually the first group of people, someone who they go on the vacation, they really want to do as little work as possible. There's just a few things that they want to do. There are other people who go to vacation, but they may still be thinking about work. They may be doing a lot of their work on vacation and not really enjoy it. So uh, how can we balance like during vacations, like some of the work we have to do with the uh, vacation experience? Well, uh, I maybe I'm a little older generation, so my attitude to my approach might be a little different, but I have what I, I call, it really doesn't matter if I'm on vacation or not, I, I call it the three-day rule. Uh, if something pops up on the first day, it's not a problem. On the second day, somebody else will deal with it. On the third day, I have to deal with it myself. And that's pretty much what I do is I monitor when I'm on vacation, I monitor my office every third day. 
because I know the three day rule pretty much will work. Uh, so that's just practice, and and maybe uh, that's uh, something I've gotten used to, and just I just live with it. But I do find that, that works very well. Uh, people that are constantly connected, constantly checking their instant messaging system, their email, even even their social media, they're really not going to recharge properly, and it's. Honestly, if they're with a family or friends, it's not fair to them. Um, you need to, in my opinion at least, uh, work hard, play hard, know when, when to do one or the other, but not mix them up every day. Probably started in my early days when I was racing out, so I got that little bit of an attitude about work hard, play hard. And uh, I really like that theme of work hard, play hard. It's something that I also um, go by as well because um, it's – you don't want to uh, half-heartedly pursue one of those two because uh, like, you don't want to be in that situation. So you want to be able to devote a lot of time towards both of those uh, areas. And one of the things that I also want to address is uh, we're talking about entrepreneurs on the move. We're talking about digital nomads. But in some cases, that just means to commute. So. Yep. Uh, how can we get better at working, like maintain some level of productivity during commutes? Like I know for some people, like they're driving in their cars, it's a little more difficult than someone on the train. But like, can you give us some pointers either way? I, I think so. I, I, I've seen a lot of people. We have offices all over the world. and So we, we, we get in and out of many different marketplaces. And I'll use London as a good example. Um, you have bus commutes, commutes on the tube, commutes on the train, and then you walk. Okay, so you have all these different types of commutes in the same marketplace. You don't have that much pure automotive commute in London, but you still have a lot of motion going around. Uh, you might ride a bike to the train station, get on a train and take the train into the tube station, take the tube uh, to the next tube station and then walk uh, five blocks. Uh, each of those different sectors have a different opportunity for activity. Um, and what I've always tried to do on commuting time is say that I, this is an opportunity for me to learn. I believe being the best student of your industry or whatever you're doing is critically important. So this is a time for me to say, I've got 30 minutes here when I can learn something, number one. Number two, um, it's a great time to deal with domestic issues, your household issues. Um, uh, you, you, you need to do something that if it starts or stops, you lose your concentration on a little bit, isn't really going to matter, but you still, it's stuff you still have to get done. And it removes stress from the day when you get to your office or when you settle down with your clients or whatever work format you're going into. You, if you have your personal stuff taken care of, your whole day goes better. You're not stressed. Uh, you can focus on work, uh, overall. And then lastly, it, it's an opportunity to organize schedules, which is a great thing to be doing when you're commuting. Again, if you have an interruption, it's okay. But to look at your calendar, define what you're going to do, who you're going to do it with, make sure that everybody has appointments set, make sure that everything you're going to do for the day or the week or whatever time period you're dealing with is properly set. Those are three really good things to do while you're commuting that uh, are, are very productive uh, and allow you to focus uh, uh, better during the day. And I mean, I, I really, I, that's why I really wanted to emphasize the commute because I feel like it's something that people are wasting. It's like people are listening to a lot of music during those commutes. Some people are just like flipping through their smartphones if they're on a train. So that's why I did want to focus on the commute because it's something it's where we spend so much time commuting and there's just so much opportunity to be productive, uh, move the ball forward. So that's why I wanted to address that. Another thing I want to uh, address is uh, that some people, they feel like um, like productivity isn't necessarily coming natural to them. And uh, with that in mind, I'm wondering, what do you believe holds most people back from being productive as they uh, live that digital nomad lifestyle? Ooh, that's a loaded question, isn't it? <laughs> um, we are each of us individually the one common link to everything we do so if something's holding you back first you need to look at you uh, and that could be you know 15 years of psychoanalysis but 
the reality is you just have to ask yourself, am I doing what I enjoy? Am I doing the best I can? And I, am I prepared to do it? Am I able to explain to others what I do and what I need to get done? Um, it's really about communications with yourself, uh, understanding where you're going and um, not changing all the time. Um, we've been at our company, we're going into our fifth iteration now for 38 years, 39 years. And we have changed our business model several times and we are changing it again right now uh, as, as times and marketplaces change. Uh, but we've never left our industry. We've stayed doing something until we became an expert. And then we became a recognized expert. And now we're thought leaders that are experts, et cetera. And uh, building that expertise, as I said earlier, being the best student of whatever you're doing and really building expertise, which gives you confidence, uh, uh, is one of the best ways to uh, go forward with whatever you're doing um, and have fun. Just have fun. Um, if you don't enjoy what you do, uh, you shouldn't be doing it. And that doesn't mean you like every little task you do, but if you don't enjoy the big picture uh, and the people you work with, then you just need a change. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. Just f find your spot and get it done. And um, I really like it, as uh, Frank mentioned, like finding your spot, like there's a point where you just have to like sit down and do the work. And um, like, if you think like for some reason you're not fully productive with this lifestyle, just like, uh, or, or on the go, just like think about something small you can do. Even if it's something as small as responding to emails and then being able to develop and do some more uh, meaningful tasks. So uh, part of that is also like, um, as Frank said, picking a spot and um, also just like maybe even starting small and then expanding uh, if you find that you are struggling with your productivity lately. And that's just one of the challenges that we face struggling with productivity. And with that in mind, Frank, I'm wondering if you could share with us one big challenge you faced in your journey and a powerful lesson you learned during that challenge. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll start to when I was very young. Um, I uh, uh, started my life as a commercial diver, uh, uh, working my way through college and doing some other things afterwards. And I started a, a diving company as an entrepreneur when I was 19. Uh, and uh, we got some good contracts and some interesting things. And I remember uh, walking down the dock one day, all kind of puffed up about a year after I'd started the company. I was really cocky. I was awful. And I'm walking down the dock, and I see my main competitor down at the end of a dock. And I walk up to him. His name was Howard. And I said, hey, Howard, how's it going? It looks like you're uh, not too busy right now because he was fishing. <clears throat> and he looked at me, and he said, yeah, you've got a lot of my accounts, a lot of my business, Frank. Um, you making any money? And I thought about it, and I, I was busy. I was really busy. And our, we were kind of growing and, uh, you know, we were feeling real good about ourselves, but I wasn't banking a lot of money. And he looked at me and he says, I'm fishing. You don't have to be both tired and hungry. So the fact that he had recognized that I was working real hard to build my company, but I wasn't making much money at it. He just sat back and thought, well, if I'm not going to make any money, I might as well go fishing. And I think that's really true. You do not need to both both tired and hungry. If you're going to work, be productive and be successful at it. Otherwise, go fishing. And I mean, that's like, there's definitely a very interesting lesson in that, uh, like not being tired and hungry. I mean, like I've never really heard it explained that way. I like, just go fishing. I mean, like it, it's a very simple lifestyle. It's one that works if you... Um, Want to pursue? I mean, like I understand how it would work, but um... well, I'll, I'll give you an, I'll give you another example. Uh, uh, later in life, sure. I was working, and uh, I had two friends that were twin brothers, and they both had exceedingly successful residential development companies. I mean, we're talking guys that are worth hundred, two hundred, three hundred million dollars. Um, so they're both very successful companies, and uh, the market uh, crashed uh, uh, on and the early mid 80s for residential development. 
went through an economic uh, cycle crash, uh, very similar to the recent recession we've been in here. And one of the brothers um, kept his entire team together, struggled, fought. He fought the depression. He fought everything. He kept everything together and he went bankrupt. The other brother shut everything down, kept a core staff on, on, on board uh, and bought a yacht and he went to Tahiti. He came back, he had all his money still, he reached, started his company, hired his brother, by the way, uh, and they built another successful company. And the same thing, you don't have to be tired and hungry. Well, the same thing that, that Jim did, he says, well, when business is good, you do it. When it's not, you go to Tahiti. So, you know, it always think of the cyclicality. Look about what's going on around you and decide how you're going to position yourself. Are you going to struggle to push through a situation? Or are you going to go relax, work on your personal skills, work on other skills, ride it out, and then be prepared with a whole bunch of new energy when the market starts up again to take advantage of it? And that's another whole process to think about. Frank, I like the other example as well. Really enforce the idea not to be both hungry and tired. And um, one of the things that I believe in is that um, if you read a lot of books, you are really setting yourself up for a strong future. And with yep. that in mind, uh, I'm wondering if you could share with us three books that you believe will have a positive impact on us. Um, uh, the Bible, the Quran, and the Torah. How's that? Um, the, I, I, I'm the opposite of yourself. I'm, I'm not a consumer of books. I'm a consumer of news. Uh, so I'm a current events person. Um, uh, I understand the value of books. And if I'm going to read something, it's going to be, a, a, an autobiography on a historical figure. Uh, and that probably goes against the grain of what, what you would expect me to say, or what you'd, you'd like, I think to hear. But I believe that so many books, particularly business books, are written by individuals that while they have experience, it may not relate to my situation. Uh, they wrote the book based on their success, which may have been five or 10 years ago, and then it took a year or two to publish the book. So it's not happening right now. It's not happening in the hour that I have to make a decision. So I really am very much uh, a news freak, business news, political news, et cetera. Uh, I want to know what's happening right now and then form my own opinions. Uh, I probably spend two hours a day though, dedicated to learning, uh, reading that information and learning uh, about my industry, consuming every piece of information I can about my industry, not just the gossip of what's going on, but uh, the little breakthroughs that the smaller operators and smaller people are making. The, the biggest people don't always have the best ideas, as you know, as we, the bigger companies slow things down, don't speed things up. Um, so I'm constantly searching for uh, global best practices, new ideas uh, on a literally on a daily and sometimes hourly basis. And I really like that focus on current events and uh, like up to date content. Like that's also a very important approach. You did mention the, uh, Religious books, which uh, we will include in the show notes for this episode, markberry.com <laughs> slash E256. Uh, we'll also throw in content marketing secrets, free, just pay for shipping. Uh, markberry.com slash book and my book, Podcast Domination, uh, will be in there as well. And uh, before we wrap up this episode, uh, Frank, I've asked you several questions throughout our time together, but what do you believe is one question that we need to be asking ourselves more often? Boy, that that's interesting. I, I I don't think I haven't thought about that. Um, I think as, as as you're trying to achieve whatever your goal is, um, that you need to assess what resources you require, um, and the questions you ask is, what do I need to get there? Um, all companies need, if they're a business, they all need customers or access to customers or at least a marketplace. Uh, all companies need access to capital um, in order to grow. And I guess all companies need flexibility. Uh, so I, I would assess the resources that I had uh, as that question and say, do I have what's necessary to go where I want to go? You don't start a trip with an empty gas tank. 
You don't go on a hike without without water. Um, am I going on this business venture with the right tools and the right resources? Frank, thank you for sharing with us that question and um, all the great insights that you shared with us throughout this episode. If you guys want to learn more about Frank, head over to Alliance Virtual Offices. Dot com That will be in the show notes. But Frank, I can't thank you enough for taking the time to share all of your great advice with us. It was such a pleasure to have you on Breakthrough Success. Mark, my pleasure. And anything I can ever do, always feel free to call. How does over 100 retweets per day sound to you? My free ebook, 27 Ways to Get More Retweets on Twitter, has you covered. I use the methods within this ebook to get over 10,000 retweets every single quarter to learn. 